The content will go from mostly user space to looking at some of the kernel. Um, this is going to be sort of mixed, mid to advanced user type of course. Um, when I started this, I thought, oh, we'll get it done. Uh, well, everything will be ready by the time I'm here. Uh, unfortunately, it's a very big area, and this is not going to be complete. Uh, we'll just talk through some of the stuff and hopefully give up people ideas. Um, warning, and before we do anything else, uh, this may cause unusable system if you do it to your own laptop or desktop. Do not use anything you care about the uptime on. Um, if you're going to do things with the scheduler, be careful. So while we can try it in a VM or some a spare machine, uh, VMs tend to really not do very well with real time. So mileage may vary there. So we'll do a very quick history. So preempt RT patches have gone back to about the Linux 2622, uh, back in about July 2007 when the aim was to improve the real-time performance, so things like reducing lock contention, making interrupts threaded so they didn't end up blocking your system, uh, improvements to the timer, read copy update. Um, the patch has been very slowly shrinking and by the time I gave this talk um, in o o OSS uh, Europe, the patch has been basically merged. So. Um, the mainline merge started around 5.15 in October 2021, and as I say, it's pretty much now officially in. I don't think we're carrying anything outside of the kernel that's actually necessary. There may be some driver bits, but I think pretty good now. So Linux process scheduling. We'll go through, basically there's normal stuff. The, this is what you're things like your web browser were probably doing, normal and such like. Not very interesting, um, but some of the techniques will um, work with that normal. There's two sets of real time. So round robin and FIFO, they're generally used for things where you want to event, do something, process it, move on. So things like video decoding we we'll often use that to make sure your performance for your YouTube or whatever is good. Um, deadline is a little bit of a special case here. The deadline scheduler is more of a, I want to do a certain amount of work every period and I have a certain deadline to do it to, which means that there are certain guarantees the kernel does make about what the availability. So deadline you cannot oversubscribe deadline, whereas the RR and FIFO, you could end up accidentally oversubscribing. Um, and as soon, now very hastily added to the slides, there's the shed ext um, work that's going in. Uh, this I have not had time to look at, so we won't discuss very much. So if you've ever looked at real-time performance on systems, there are usual sources of interference, which are first up other processes. If you don't get your scheduling algorithm, uh, scheduling priorities and things right, or other issues, you will end up causing yourself problems there. And then there's other things that can come along, such as interrupt. Um, as we said, the kernel preemption is much better these days. Hardware settings, it's amazing how many things that your BIOS or other trusted services may end up causing, or a hypervisor, or some other external event. So, for instance, on laptop thermal management, um, ACPI stuff, they could, yeah, could end up running and you have no idea. Um, so, our aim here is to misbehave. So how would we disrupt the proper scheduling of processes? So we'll go through things, the really easy stuff first, unexpected error returns. You can modify API call parameters, and then we'll go through some of the ideas about adding actually time variances to the scheduling 
schedule, scheduling, um, such as um, possibly unblockable events or scheduling time adjustments. So go through some implementation of some things. Uh, oh, firstly, oh, why would we do this? Yeah, that's a good, good question. Um, well, the first thing is testing. Um, it's amazing how many people forget to test that the idea that something may fail, especially with deadline when you could overcommit, um, or in case of some of the work we've been doing, fault detection, because if your system is becoming oversubscribed or other issues like that, you may want to start mitigating away from the fact that your car, car's headlights are going to stop working. Um, possibly not because they've just run into a tunnel and your cloud connection has just gone away. Let's actually talk about something more useful. So, and I was actually uh, su surprised to find that um, something we were looking at, um, so the stress NG tool, which is something you can use to stress systems, and it's one of actually good user space tools for generating stress, actually, if you run it as a deadline task, it only ever checks the error on the first thread it starts. So if you start four or five deadline threads, one of them can get admitted, or two of them can get admitted to the deadline class. The next one doesn't, because it never checked the error on its scheduling call. Uh, then you have a system where you have a high priority thread just sitting spinning, because it's not doing it's not doing the expected behavior of running for some time and the kernel removing it from the run queue. And so we actually found that little issue. We reported that and actually it's been fixed. So we actually have a good result from actually some of our first testing. So, okay, so moving from why to how, we have our lovely good tux here and our very evil tux. You can tell he's evil because he's got red eyes and a goatee and he probably wants to install Windows on your laptop. Yeah, I can do art. So we'll do a very quick run through some user space solutions. Um, these are mostly going to be how do we inject errors. Um, there, are, there are other, other ways that we could probably cause issues with um, user space, just using like uh, U-probes. Um, I was quite surprised that S-Trace can even cause um, faults in fault injections. So um, another, another thing, as we talked about with the previous slide of stress NG, if you modify your user space limits, things might then expect they find that they don't have the resources they expected and fail, or fail to notice. So this was a quick uh, test using S-Trace, so um, this is a quick example. Uh, we trace something called simple deadline, which is a piece of code I wrote. Um, we attach an event to the shed yield call, which says when we want to yield our time slice, um, and then we say, ah, after the second call, every four times, return an error. So um, very simple. Easy to set up, only affects the process running, so isn't going to cause your uh, other problems. However, this doesn't work well with systems where you may fork because s doesn't really deal with that. It's only a very simple way of injecting errors. So yeah, can't really synchronize multiple processes. Um, you won't get all your issues here, but at least it has some functionality and it probably is installed on your system. So, talk a little bit about moving to the kernel. So, um, firstly, there is a kernel fault injection framework, so we could look at that. Uh, there's eBPF, very useful, been talked about before in this conference, versatile way of loading code into the kernel. Um, various probe, probing. Um, at the bottom, we have the kernel patching. Now, I was trying to avoid this because you end up into 
having to maintain your own patches or trying to get upstream to take your solution. I don't know whether upstream is very interested in fault injection at the moment. Um, I don't know, we'll see. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't get enough time to really finish this and this topic, you could say, um, the kernel is very large. So um, the fault injection framework we'll talk very quickly about. It's been in the kernel since 4.16. Um, however, not everybody will ship this. Um, obviously, it's not very useful for production systems. So a lot of, lot of distributions will not run config fault injection. It's a debug, in, debug FS interface. It does have, have useful things like being able to filter standard injection points um, and it can attach to known functions. However, it's global. Um, it really does need additions to be more useful for this sort of thing. And I can actually get it to work, so I didn't really go further into this. So, next thing I thought about was eBPF. So that's been in the kernel since 3.18. Um, tooling around loadable code, it can attach to things like kernel functions, trace points. It has very useful extensive tooling, which has been talked about today. Um, it allows you to share data of user space, so if you wanted to reconfigure your program, you, there are various tooling to say change the parameters that the BPF code may be look, looking at. Um, we've used this to do uh, monitoring of real-time processes ourselves, so doing the sort of opposite of attaching to various trace points and returning data to a user watchdog. Uh, the, the big advantage of this, it is a lot more likely to be in your favorite distribution. It's used by a lot of other things. Um, so if we looked at something similar to our previous, you can use BPF trace, uh, sorry, um, which is a command line interface. Uh, it's like a sort of scripting thing. However, this does actually provide a, this does rely on a kernel option that is not always shipped. You have to set config BPF K probe override. Otherwise, the BPF code is not allowed to override the function call. So in this example, we're adding a K probe to the shed yield. Uh, we look, we're filtering on a PID. Um, this is an arbitrary PID number I was using. Um, and we are saying again, our little bit of code in the middle is saying if the count becomes greater than four, reset the count, return minus one from the shed yield. And we can do the same, uh, but we can do a little bit more with this one. So in this case, we can say any program called simple deadline. So matching our filter on task name, and we can use a random. So we can say, um, uh, I think that if my maths is correct, that should be one in eight times, return a minus one from shed yield. So it is more useful. You can write little programs, load them, remove them. So first, we've um, talked a little bit about some fault injection from simple ideas of API disruption. Uh, again, you could probably also change parameters those ways. Not sure if that's going to be much use. Um, we'll talk a bit about trying to manipulate the timing of the process. So again, we can do some of this from user space. Um, you can inject wake-ups to tasks um, by sending them signals. That can be done quite easily. Um, you could also inject delays into certain calls if you wanted to. So, going through some of my initial thoughts about what I was doing on this. So we want to do things like add delays into running processes to see how that would affect, certainly for deadline scheduling, because if you start overrunning 
you end up with the kernel will either steal time from somebody else or start throttling you. You could try moving tasks from core to core to see how that, um, modifying the next wake up time or force wake up of a task. Again, not sure how much useful that is with certainly anything that isn't a deadline task. Um, so the initial thoughts are try to avoid touching scheduling internals. Um, we've already said a little bit about runtime parameter changes. We won't talk about that again. Um, so let's have a quick think about how we look at the kernel. Um, so most of the schedule code very nicely sits under kernel, the kernel shed, sash shed directory. Um, that's how 57,000 lines of code, and I'm betting it's not going to get smaller. Uh, that doesn't, um, doesn't include arch architecture specific or k-config options you could use. Uh, and now, of course, we've got ShedX coming along. So, um, however, at least a lot of the Shed code uses some core functionality like Shed clock to get its time. So, what can we do? So, we can probably think about k-probes, which is a way of probing onto various functions. I mean, we did, I did have a look at using the kernel's trace point code, whether that could be used to grab, but unfortunately some of that's called under locks and makes it very difficult to do anything around there. So, unfortunately, it's now looking much more likely we'd have to patch actually into the code. Um, so, I mean, they say trace points, useful, point, uh, useful places in the kernel code where people have defined um, things that are useful for people. Um, unfortunately, they say it's post decision making. Um, and I mean, if you look, I did a little example of a BPF trace using a trace point. Um, shows task switching. Do not use this on a loaded system. You will get far too much output. So I was really hoping that BPF would provide some useful things here. Um, however, unfortunately, it really only has a, set of, a subset of kernel functionality available to it. Um, you can't really delay your sleep. Um, and unless you really want to um, spend a lot of time modifying the kernel. You really can only use the unstable interfaces um, and that doesn't work with the BPF trace. You'd actually have to start using BPF code. So next thing I started looking at using K probes. So writing K probe and C. Um, so C allows you to use lots more unsafe features. Um, Unfortunately, we're still rather constrained by the fact that certain parts of the schedule are called under lock and are not, you really can't actually sleep. Uh, and now you actually have to write your own filtering code. So um, one of the sort of rabbit holes I was thinking about at this point was could we have a way of adding BPF code that you could call from C? And I tried using K probes again, and then you run into recursive K probes, don't work very well either. So, um, now this is the sort of point where I was hoping to have got more work done on this by now. Um, but we diving into the actual kernel scheduling code. Really, actually, there's only one central point where it makes actual decisions about what's going to happen. Um, that's the schedule. Um, however, that is unfortunately marked as not probable for various good reasons, um, which makes even like using K-probes really difficult for here. Um, you can sort of attach them and uh, you can also start getting to the point where you're going to shoot yourself in the foot. Um, so schedule basically uses pick next task to choose 
what it's going to run. However, that actually must return a task. It's also not exported, so I may end up inlined. So again, Kpros is not going to be much help here. So it's unlikely we'll be able to successfully override that. Um, and what's also annoying is that whilst there is a shed clock call to get the time, which we thought, OK, we can use that to try and modify that return time to make the scheduler think it's not quite as early or late as it was, it turns out that actually that value does get cached in bits of the scheduler code, which means that um, you'd end up affecting far more tasks than you originally intended. So uh, this is turning out to be a lot more work than we originally intended. Also, you have shed deadline, which is, uh, is this little special case here. Um, again, we could probably think about what happens if uh, we woke it up early um, and how it would affect future periods. Um, and also then delayed wake up, how we end up adding time to the process. So we may end up actually having to really alter this code as well. So we're ending up with far more alterations than we really wanted to at the first. Um, for other scheduling classes, well, early wake up may or may not be useful. Um, entirely possible that you'd end up waking something up and it's just going to wake an internal kernel process that's going to go, well, that wasn't ready. I'm just going to go back to sleep. So. The question is whether that would actually be useful or not. Waking something up early, probably the only way to do that is going to be signal. So that would maybe be useful testing of code that's handling wakes. Uh, sorry, that would be useful. Might be useful testing of kernel that's handling wait for an event and see whether it deals very nicely with signals. Um, again, late wake up should probably be easier because you can just add a delay into the task. Um, I was looking into this and probably just adding either like high resolution timer, which should then wake the task back up or trying to insert a, just a delay into the return path. So, so my initial conclusions from this, um, well, it's fairly easy to insert um, API errors. You can probably very easily write wrapper code around your own um, processes to add delays where you're um, doing the scheduling or other calls. Um, however, the actual whole kernel scheduling stuff, it turns out to be a lot, a lot harder than we've first thought, there's a rather more code to go through. Um, so unfortunately, we didn't really get a lot of the harder items completed, and they're still work in progress. I was hoping to have done more work on this since I presented this at uh, OSSEU. But it turns out, unfortunately, customers are a pain in the backside and want you to do work for them instead of sitting around doing interesting stuff with kernel schedulers. Um, so, my last take out of this is very possibly patching of the scheduler would be inevitable. And again, whether that would be something we would end up having to keep um, in our own tree or whether we could come up with a solution that maybe the kernel community would find acceptable. Um, I, the big question here is, and we've been having this debate very much internally, is how much do we actually think this is useful for projects? So um, there's a very much a train of thought that really just test it on a real system. And if it turns out to work most of the time, then you're probably good enough. Um, yeah, I have met one or two kernel, not kernel, sorry. 
one or two user space people who just think that errors are for losers. So, I say for um, future work we're thinking of is whether we should look into patching the schedule to make these sort of injections easier. Um, I mean, with the new Shedex class, that might make this more usable. But again, as I say that ha I haven't had time to look into that. Um, so it's possible that we could use Shedex to wrap a, around an existing scheduler and then maybe use that. Um, also, um, really, we didn't dig very much into any sort of external event generation. So on x86, that might be, could you generate some sort of ACPI or external event that would cause something to run? Um, again, that would be similar for ARM with uh, something like the trusted firmware um, that lives in a higher level than the kernel and therefore can actually take time out of it. And the also whether we should go through and try and see if anybody's interested in whether kernel modifications would be useful or not. Again, that would probably come out of whether this could be done with the new Shedex. Um, and unfortunately, I didn't really get much time to finish the materials. Um, I think, yeah. Ah, yes, finally. So I have put some initial, a little, a couple of simple programs and some notes from the slides. Um, I can't remember if I've uploaded a slide deck to there or not. I, sh I actually did finally remember to upload it to the site this afternoon before, at least th this time I did it before I gave the talk instead of after. Um, and hopefully I'll get some time to actually get some more work done on this. So, um, as I mentioned earlier, even though VMs may be not great for actually <coughs> timing anything, at least you can run your code without the um, fun of accidentally taking your entire machine out. So I've set up my little Debian VM and I've been testing my own kernel on that. Um, I've started w work on <coughs> the modifications to actually embed code into the scheduler for doing things like adding delays on exit. Um, I also try to start trying to do some investigations whether we'd also insert diversions into a task that would say, instead of coming back to where it was originally meant to, stack off the state, divert by something that might say, oh, by the way, just do a delay here. Um, there's quite a lot of interesting ways you can mess with process state. Um, most of it usually doesn't cause a crash. So, um, the slides have some references to some useful articles. Um, we ourselves have done some work on stable, latency stabilization. Um, there's a lot of good work from various people like the open source development labs who actually track how well the real-time system is working and keep a lot of metrics about all sorts of different systems, how they respond, latency, deadlines, things like that. Um, and I so say there's some uh, references for things like BPF trace, uh, how it can use the K probes and things like that. So thank you. I was hoping this was going to be much more of a finished presentation, but as I say, the, the field turned out to be much larger than we expected. So hopefully this is a start of 
maybe people can think about what they would like out of any sort of system like this and if other people are interested maybe it would be worth doing some more investigation in this and maybe next year we can come back with a kernel real time well kernel um, scheduling test suite well sorry not test suite really um, fault injection framework so I've got about six minutes if people are interested in questions. Hopefully I didn't start oh. snoring through that because... Was it? <laughs> no, so basically you're interested in just in, uh, injecting delays in the scheduler mostly, is that...? So, the, yeah, the, the sort of, well, one of the things would be delays or maybe, I mean, early wake-ups are also possible, they may be easier than the yeah. whole delay. Well, I mean, well wait, so, early, oh, so modify the wake-up to come earlier, so basically inject yeah. a bug into the kernel? Yeah, that's, yeah. Because uh, early, uh, yeah. early wake-up would be a, considered a bug, but the um, delaying of the thing, because I said you looked like you mm. were trying to find a way to sleep or something, but why don't you just do a spin? I mean, that, then you could do it uh, with locks held. That might be something. Um, Again, we we started on this journey, and then it sort of became yeah. rather bigger than we were thinking. Um, because you delay as a spin, that's just yeah. yeah. So that would be, but we would try and do it in the task context, not in a. If you're not careful, you end up appropriating time to the wrong thing. Um, yeah, that would. It's certainly one of the things we were thinking about is adding some delays on the return paths. Um, spinning might be one of them, adding another sleep. Um, and if like you that. wanted to, I mean, you could always do like the live kernel patching type of approach too, and also hijacked functions. So basically, if you create, create your own module, you put a module mm. in, connect to a function, and basically, hey, I'm going to have this function return, or not call, just return an error. It could, yeah, I mean, a certain amount of that, as I say, can be already done with some of the tooling we talked about. Um, as I say, unfortunately, some of the bits of the scheduler are sort of inlined, which means that trying to get at them can be difficult. And um, then K-probe. Yeah, it's, yeah. Um, and again, K-probes cause yeah. their own problems. Yeah, so the, the current K-probes actually that you cannot uh, sweep or any, uh, what's it, that the locking inside that because that it's a exception. Yeah. So that, uh, yeah, uh, it cannot sweep. Uh, I have a question, uh, what's it, that the plan to uh, introduce, uh, just an idea to introduce that are the, what's it, that the on-context uh, K-probes so that are, that are Let's say that uh, we can maybe can uh, run their handler, use a handler in the same context, yeah, uh, using the, the K probes. But I'm still not yeah. sure it can be done. Yeah, yeah I mean, let's uh, say when I started this, we were thinking this would be great, it'll be easy, we'll have it all done, ready for present, and then turns out. It's a lot harder, and there's probably a lot more to do here than just one talk's worth of material. So, yeah. Um, but I'm, I'm sure that the why you need a, um, let's see, um, an, uh, a modified kernel to use it, or you can, uh, if you want to uh, introduce a new uh, fault injection uh, to the upstream kernel, Hmm. Uh, maybe we can uh, accept that. Uh, that is only for the, uh, the debug kernel, because that are, you, hmm. I, I think that you don't uh, want to run this uh, on the production kernel. No. no. So, so yes, that would be definitely something you probably wouldn't want to do under production. Um, hmm. This is more, our first thinking about this was more of a debug way hmm. of saying, what happens if the system goes wrong? Yeah. And how would we do that in a way that we could then say, yeah, in test that, our mitigations? Yeah, in that case, you should uh, implement that on the uh, 
port injection, um, what's it, that framework? Yeah, that, that might be, I say, we were, it, we did look at initially the fault injection framework just as a quick way of starting. Mm. Um, unfortunately, it turned, it turned out not to be an easy thing just to use what was there. Mm. Um, and I say our original journey was to try and avoid patching the kernel if we could. Mm -hmm. um, I think we've come to the point we've realized that something, if we were to use something like we'd either have to extend fault injection or provide a way of hooking these systems where you could use something like BPF or mm -hmm. something like that to say, okay, this is now where we want to do something bad. Yeah, because uh, BP, both BPF and uh, k are uh, only for the say, monitoring the, the system. Uh, yeah. it, that should not uh, change the, the, the system behavior. Only, right. uh, what's it, that's KDX or something like that will be uh, allowed. So, yeah, yeah, when I started doing this, I didn't know about ShedX. So, again, um, and unfortunately, this this project has wandered down the priority list of things that I was doing. So, I'm hoping to come back and look at this, and maybe I'm also hoping that maybe this is interest, interesting enough for other people. Because if it isn't interesting enough for other people, there's probably uh, it may not even be worth trying to do much more than what we're doing. So, um, I believe we've got two minutes left, so uh, is there anyone else who's interested in a question? Oh, yes, uh, thank you for your talk. And yeah. uh, I know it's an uh, unfinished project, but I want to ask about whether you have thinking about testing against like priority inversions or priority inheritance. Algorithm because yeah. there's also a very important topic in the real time. Really yes, we didn't area. look at any of the priority inversions and whether this would interact with those. Um, again, this is sort of stacking on more things that we didn't start on thinking about when we started on this. Um, again, that might be another way of introducing interference into the system is to actually disrupt either the priority inversions or how those would be set up from uh, the, well, things like few texts. Yes. Um, again, this is something that we really went, let's try to do something simple first. And then all these things sort of come out of this, of going actually how much do we actually really want to do? So, again, there's a lot of stuff. So yes, thank you for the, that question. Um, yeah. I'm sure there's also other, a lot of other things you can do. Um, that might come under the whole, your, you've got your own tasks wrong, not that the kernel is doing something, um, something incorrect, because generally if we got something like that wrong, we'd have found it by now. Thank you for your answer. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think we're about out of time. So thank you. And hopefully um, we'll see some more work on this. Right.